Hi, I'm Phil Huber from Woodsmith Magazine, here with Old House Journal to talk about building a simple project. It's this shaker bench, and it would look great in any style of old house because you can customize it to match both the materials and paint colors that you want. Best of all, you can make it from just one long 8-foot 1x12 board and some really simple tools. Now to get things started, I want to talk about the board itself. Now it does come from a board that's called a 1x12, but it actually measures 3 quarters of an inch thick and is 96 inches long. Now when you're picking out your board, there's a few things you want to look at. The first is that it's pretty straight. You don't want it bending along its length or bowing across it or even having cupping where the inside is kind of hollow shaped. So spend a little bit of time looking through the boards to find the one that you want. From there, you can begin to lay out the pieces on your board. And that's what I've done already here. I use the dimensions in the plans and then a tape measure and a pencil. And I started by marking at each end. I have one leg on each side. And then I have the top piece right here. And the reason that I laid the top piece out here is because this whole section is free of knots. It's going to be the showpiece of the project, and I want it to look its best. Then I have the middle stretcher that's going to go here. Now when you're laying out the parts, you want to make sure that you keep those pieces that need to be the same length as close as possible. And for this project, it's the two legs. So what I did is measured along the length, made a mark on my board, and then I'm just using a simple combination square to make a straight square line all the way across the width of the board. Because this one's pretty wide, I had to mark from both sides. Once that's done, it's time to start grabbing some tools and cutting our board down into its project parts. You can go as crazy as you want on tooling for cutting these pieces to size. But I want to keep things simple here and accessible. So I'm going to do most of the cutting with just a cordless jigsaw. They're pretty inexpensive and not that intimidating to use. The big thing with a jigsaw, though, is being able to make straight, accurate cuts. If you use your jigsaw a lot, you'll get the practice and you'll develop the hang of it, and you can get this done pretty easily. But I'm not quite at that level, so I like to give myself as much help as possible. And what I'm going to do is use one of these plastic rafter squares. Now, it looks like a triangle, but it's called a square, and it has this heel on the back edge, and that can register on the back side of my workpiece. Then the raised part can guide the edge of my jigsaw, so I can hold it in place, line it up, and now I can make a straight, clean cut. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind whenever you're using power tools is to use the right safety equipment. You want to use safety glasses, just to keep any chips and debris from flying into your eyes. And even though a jigsaw isn't that loud, a set of hearing protection is always a good idea too. And now that I have my pieces all cut to size, I want to take care of a detail before we move on. Using a jigsaw can sometimes leave kind of a ragged, jaggedy edge on the ends of your pieces. Later on, we're going to do some final sanding before we apply either a clear finish or some paint. But I still want to take care of this right now. A couple of options here. 
One that's any good tool to have is a file. This one's a half round file. So one face is flat, the other one has a curve to it. And I can run the file along the edge to remove any blade marks and that at an angle to clean up this jagged edge here. If you don't have a file, no worries. You can go with another option that works just as well. Here I have a leftover piece of plywood from another project. On this side, I applied some coarse sandpaper. Now the sandpaper that I like to use comes in rolls and is adhesive backed on one side so I can just stick it down. You can use regular sandpaper and use some spray adhesive to attach it to the board. I'm using 100 grit because I want to get this job done pretty quickly. So I'm going to start by taking my board and making long passes on the end of it to clean up the blade marks left by the jigsaw. It doesn't take real long. And you can really measure your progress by seeing how the board is smoothing out. Then I'll also run it at an angle. Along the top, you can see we got a pretty nice looking cut end here. I'll take care of all of that on the ends of my pieces and then it's time to start adding some detail to the legs. Okay, I have my two leg pieces here, ends are all cleaned up. What I want to do now, according to the plans, is to make a semicircular cutout on the bottom of each of the legs. This does more than make the legs look pretty. By adding that cutout, I've turned what's essentially one bearing surface on the floor into two separate feet. This is going to make the bench a lot more stable when you have it resting on the floor, and it's going to be a lot more easier to level the bench when we're all done. Now to make that arc, I'm going to use a compass. This one's kind of fancy, but I like using it. An ordinary school compass would work just as well. Now I've opened it up to four and a half inches according to the plans. What I need now is to find the center point of my board so that I can strike my arc. In order to find the center point, I'm going to grab that combination square that I used earlier. The blade or the ruler on the combination square is exactly 12 inches long. So what I'll do is set one end of the ruler even with one edge of the board and now I'm going to swing it around until the other end is even with the board. When I find that I can find the midpoint of the ruler which just so happens to be six inches and I can use the square now to line up with that mark and draw a line. That represents the center point or the center line of my foot. So I'll put the compass right on that line. Now it's tough to keep the compass registered right at the end of the board so I cheated a little and brought it in just enough to be able to poke in on the board. And draw my line. And I'm ready to grab the jigsaw again. The only thing is that it can be pretty difficult to hold on to this piece and cut at the same time. So I'm going to use a pair of small clamps. That holds the piece in place while I'm cutting. Then to follow the curve and get the smoothest curve possible, I'm going to make some relief cuts. Now these are just straight cuts that go in from the end of the board and get close to but not quite touching my curved line. I'll make a few of them on each side. That way when I'm cutting as the blade follows along the pencil line and it gets to those relief cuts, the waste piece is just going to fall away. That helps the blade turn the corner smoothly and you'll see that it results in a much smoother cut. Okay, I've completed all the jigsawing for the legs and I've turned the piece around so you can see what I'm going to be doing for this next step. What I want to do is clean up the lumps and bumps and any jagged marks left by the jigsaw blade. 
depending on how close you are to the line, there's definitely going to be some work involved. Now, I'm not perfect with a jigsaw, so you can see some transition points that I need to work on. To do that, I'm going to grab that half round file that I talked about earlier. This time I'm going to use the half round side to be able to follow the edge of the curve. Now here's where you need to either control or let go your inner OCD. For the most part when I'm cutting, I try and leave my pencil line so that I have a guide to follow. But for me, the most important part is that when I look at the curve and then feel it with my hand, I want it to feel smooth. If it looks and feels smooth, it is. And after a while, we're going to sand this all flush, and any places that I've either gone past my line or left it are going to get erased. So all the evidence is going to be gone. And most of the time, the bench is going to be upright on the floor, and you're really not going to see minor inconsistencies here. Now That being said, you still want to do a good job. So when you're using a file, even though it has just a handle on one end, I use a two-handed grip where I have one hand on the handle and one on the edge. And then I'm going to make a stroke, but not just straight down. Instead, I'm going to go down, rotating the file slightly and moving it along the edge of the piece. Because of the way the grain goes on this board, I'm going to go kind of downhill with the grain, working from the center line out towards the end of the board. It goes pretty smoothly, and when you use this rotating sliding stroke, you're going to end up by feathering out any of those lumps and bumps in your piece and the result is going to be much smoother and you'll get there a lot quicker too. There's one other arc that we need to cut here. We've taken care of the two in the legs, but the middle stretcher that spans between those two legs has an arc as well. Now that's a longer piece and a much wider arc, and it's frankly just a little bit too much for my compass. So, and it's probably going to be the case for a school compass as well. What can you do? Well, the answer is to just take a piece of scrap wood. What I've done is I've put a nail in one end, to serve as my pivot point. In the other end, at the radius of my arc that I need, I just drilled a hole that I can just slip a pencil into. So what I'll do is I've marked a center line on the, along the length of my stretcher piece, and then there's a four inch offset from the top edge of the stretcher. So that's where the arc needs to start. And then I continued that center line onto a scrap piece left over from when I was cutting all the parts to size. This way I know exactly where I can set up my pivot pin. So I'll put one, the pencil point right where my arc needs to stop and then align the pin in that scrap piece. And now I can scribe a line both ways for the arc cutout that needs to happen in the stretcher. Then it's back to the jigsaw and the file to clean things up and make a nice smooth arc. Notice when I was cutting the curve on the underside of the stretcher that I didn't make any relief cuts. There's a reason for that. That's because this curve is so much wider and gentler than the two in the legs that the relief cuts weren't necessary. You can see I still ended up with a pretty smooth surface. Now what we want to do is move on to the next step where we're going to start joining parts together. Specifically, we're going to start with connecting the stretcher to the two feet or the two legs. To do that, the plans call for cutting a dado or a groove along the inside face of each of the feet and then also on the underside of the top. I don't think that's necessary, but if you have the tooling to do that, feel free to go ahead and do it. Instead, I'm going to rely on the screws. So what I did is I grabbed my combination square, did the old ruler trick and marked a center line on the outside face of both of my legs. 
Then I marked the location according to the plans where the two screws on each end are going to be. Now I want to hide those screws with some wood plugs later on. So to do that, it's going to call for a specialized drill bit, but it's not that expensive and it's probably something you're going to want to have on hand anyway. It's called a pilot bit or a combination bit. And what it does is it has a, what looks like a normal drill bit on, one, on the end to drill a pilot hole for the screw, allow it to pass through the leg and then into the stretcher. But then it also has this part here where it'll drill a counter sink, an angled hole, and then a counter bore, which just means a slightly larger hole. And that'll allow me to set the screw below the surface and then I can fill that gap with a wood plug. Makes for a nice clean look. So before I start drilling, I wanna grab one of my scrap pieces and I'm gonna set that underneath the piece that I'm going to drill into. That's going to support the bottom side of the leg and then the bit as it comes through on the back side isn't going to leave a ragged hole. Now before we can transfer the screw locations from the leg into the stretcher, there's something I want to show you. When I line these two pieces up, you'll notice that the stretcher hangs down below where the surface of the, or below the arc on the legs. It's not going to look real good. So what I'm going to do is just take a pencil, mark where that location is, and set that off to the side. Then I'll grab my square and then you can see my line and I'm going to come just a little bit below that. And I'll do that on both sides. And I'll cut that away with the jigsaw real quick and then we can move on to the assembly. Okay, we're ready now to start putting some stuff together. What I want to do is mark the location of the screw holes from the leg onto the stretcher and drill some pilot holes there too. So I started by marking a center line on the bottom edge of the stretcher. That's going to line up with the center line that I have on this side. I marked one on the opposite face too. So I can hold that in place. Then I'll grab my drill just press the bit into the soft end grain on the stretcher. Then I'll just drill pilot holes in the end of the stretcher. Now I'm going to switch to a driver bit. I'm going to bring the leg into place and I'm going to carefully drive a screw through the leg, line it up with my screw hole there, lock it down, get my other one. Now I'm just going to repeat the process on the other end and then we'll be ready to get started to add the top. Okay, I think our base assembly here is starting to look pretty good. What we can do now, because I usually try to get ahead of myself at some point in the process, is to put the top on and we can start to see how this bench is going to take shape. I think it looks pretty good. Now to attach the bench to the base, we're going to use screws that are driven in through the top. Now I don't want to do this from the top side because it's going to involve a lot of measuring to make sure that I get those screw holes exactly in the right spot. 
So the easy way around that is I'm going to flip the top over. Now I'm going to put my base on it and I'll make sure that it's flush on the edges. And then I can use my ruler to get it pretty well centered. When it's where I like it, it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. This project is pretty forgiving. I'll just double check that it's flush. Then I'm going to use a pencil and trace around the legs. And the stretcher. So when I pull off the base assembly, I can see exactly where those pieces are. Now I can grab my drill and the pilot bit and drill the pilot holes until the bit just pokes through the upper surface of the top. Then I'll flip the top over, complete the pilot hole, and drill the counter bores to allow the screws to be set below the surface. It's a pretty cool trick. Okay, we have our bench assembled, and I think it's looking pretty good. Now we want to take care of those screw holes that we made when we recessed the screw heads. And you have a few options here. You can kind of go crazy, make your own plugs if you want to with a special drill bit. But just about any home store, home center, or hardware store will have an assortment of ready-made screw plugs. And they come in a wide variety of colors and wood materials and even styles. So I want to talk about a few of them. What you have is kind of a basic rounded cap that you can put in there. You can also find ones that are designed for a flush fit where you tap them in and leave them just flush and then sand them smooth. And then you can also find these guys that are, uh, I don't know, they look like little mushrooms. So you can put those in and then that adds an accent so that it creates a domed, rounded surface on them. And like I said, you can try and find something that's going to match the color of the material that you have or go for something a little bit more of a complementary color or a contrasting color. So for me, while I was picking those out, I thought what I'd do on the, for the screws on the ends, on the legs, I'm going to use these little walnut mushroom cap ones. It'll be a good contrast, and I like the textural difference between the rounded top and then just the smooth sides. Key thing, though, before you do that, it's a good idea to sand the sides first, because once that mushroom cap is in there, it's going to be harder to be able to sand all the way around it. Then for the top, I don't really want to use the mushroom caps there, because that's going to leave little raised bumps that might feel a little uncomfortable when I'm changing my shoes. So I found the walnut flush caps. To install those, all I do is take a little bit of glue, because frankly these aren't taking a lot of stress, put it around there, set the cap in place, then with just a hammer or a mallet, I'm a woodworker so I have a mallet, pound them in until they seat. Once the glue dries, We'll come back and sand those flush. It's the same way for the cap, the acorn caps, except here I'm going to put a little bit of glue on the cap itself. They're kind of tiny. And then I'll fit that into the hole. Then you just tap it in.
we're really in the home stretch here on our bench project. What I'm doing now is just going over things with some final sanding before we apply some finish. Now, sanding is really something you don't want to skip here. And that's because the machines and the robots that made the wood from the trees are going to leave like a subtle rippled pattern all the way across. We want to remove those milling marks. The quick and easy way to do that for me is to have one of these five inch random orbit sanders. The cordless ones are really nice, but even the corded ones do a great job. Now on pine like this, I can use a 120 grit disc and get the job done pretty quickly. You want to go through all the surfaces. You could also do this before you assemble all the pieces for the last time, but honestly I sometimes just get a little too excited and want to see everything put together. So that's where I am here. After going over everything with the power sander, I usually go over it again with a cork sanding block. You can find these at hardware stores and most paint stores sell them too. And that you'll just use the same grit, 120. And go over every surface. Now don't forget to take care of the ends and the edges of the boards too. And then I also like to hold the sanding block at an angle. And just knock off the corners and the edges. It's going to make the boards feel a little bit more comfortable and they're going to accept the finish, whether it's a clear finish or a paint, a lot better. And don't forget, do the same thing down here at the bottom of the legs. And that easing means that when this bench gets slid around in your home, those legs aren't going to splinter and chip out. So once I get done with all of this, we can talk a little bit about the finish we're going to use. Okay, here we are at the last stage, applying some finish. Like I said at the beginning, this bench would be a prime candidate for some paint or a clear finish. I'm going to go with clear finish because I like how the pine ages over time. I'm going to use an oil-based polyurethane, and I like how the polyurethane with the oil in it offers a nice amber glow to it, and it's going to help this pine look its best. Now over time, because pine is a little bit soft, this thing's going to accumulate some wear and tear and some dings. I think that's only going to add to its charm. Now to apply it, I'm just using these foam brushes because they're inexpensive and once I'm done I can just throw them away. So what I'll do is I'll just dip it into the finish and begin brushing it on. You want to get a, an even wet coat, but you're not looking for anything that's going to leave a lot of puddles. And then don't forget to get all of the surfaces. There's a lot of nooks and crannies on this project. You want to make sure you take care of them. Once you've applied oil to the entire project, you want to wipe it down with a cloth just to remove any excess and allow that to dry, usually overnight. Then I'll apply a second coat, maybe a third to the top, just to give it some added protection. Now one thing to keep in mind, when you're using cloths, you want to lay them out flat to dry, because if they stay wadded up, they can eventually spontaneously combust. So you want to stay safe here. Once they're hard and dry, you can just toss them into the garbage can. Well, there you have it. We have a great looking bench. All it took was a single board, just a few tools, and a few hours of time. In less than a weekend, you can come up with a great looking bench. Now where would you use it? I could see it hanging out by the back door. It's a great place to serve as a landing spot for groceries or a place to change your shoes in the morning. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and you'll be inspired to build your own version. I'd love to see what it looks like. Thanks.